everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited about our panel today. Today's panel is on women in calligraphy. Um, there's a lot to talk about, and we will try to cover a lot of ground from the past to present and the future of women in calligraphy. We will have uh, 45 minutes of a moderated panel discussion, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience. You can use the Q&A icon on your Zoom screen to send in your questions anytime during the panel. For those watching on Facebook Live, please uh, feel free to submit your questions there. Before I hand it over to our moderator, Mariam Loden, I wanted to introduce our amazing and inspiring panelists today. It is incredibly hard to distinguish between these three amazing um, calligraphers, so I'm gonna introduce them in alphabetical order. First up is Eleanor Aisha Hollins. Eleanor's passion and enthusiasm for calligraphy began during a visit to Istanbul, Turkey as a teenager. She later found master calligrapher Muhammad Zakaria and began the study of Arabic script. After years of study and many trips to Istanbul, Eleanor received her ijazah for a calligraphic diploma for Thuluth and Nas scripts in 2013. Eleanor is an expert in Latin script calligraphy. Her work includes exhibiting, teaching, doing commercial and commission work. Eleanor is also a resident instructor for Scripts and Scribes, where she teaches both online and in our physical workshops, which we are hoping will be back in 2021. Next is Gulnaz Mahboub. Gulnaz is a UK-based, classically trained calligrapher and teacher. In 2005, after a trip to Istanbul, Gulnaz started studying under world-renowned Turkish master Hasan Chalabi. In 2012, Gulnaz received her ijazah from her teacher. She holds an MA in Social Anthropology from SOAS University of London and a BA in Communication Studies in Graphic Arts and Illustration from Anglia Ruskin University. Recently, Gulnaz donated one of her works to the Cambridge Mosque Project, a project designed to raise funds for Cambridge, England's first fully eco-friendly mosque. And last, but certainly not least, is Nuria Garcia Masi. In 1999, Nuria traveled to Morocco where she developed an interest in Islamic art. In 2000, she was in Washington, DC, where she studied the Rika, Thuluth, and Nas scripts with master calligrapher Muhammad Zakaria. In 2004, Nuria moved to Istanbul where she continued to study the Thuluth and Nas scripts with masters Hassan Chalabi and Daoud Bektesh. In 2007, she received her ijazah. She holds a master's in art history from Sorbonne University and has won prestigious prizes in international calligraphy competitions. Thank you so much to all three of you for joining us today. With that, I will turn it over to Mariam, who is a student of Arabic calligraphy as well and has been studying under master calligrapher Muhammad Zakaria. Mariam, please take it away. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in this new digital world that we have. Um, we've been blessed today to speak with three calligraphers who can trace their lines through one step or two to Hassan Chalabi, who's a master calligrapher based in Turkey. And we hear these names. We hear Chalabi, we hear Hamid, we hear Nazif and Sami. But what we don't hear is the names of many women calligraphers. And it's a bit strange because when we walk into these workshops, they are filled to nearly 90% with women. And so we wonder, is this a turning point? Is this a breakthrough for women in calligraphy? But as we saw in the slideshow, we have had female calligraphers in our tradition for many, many years, and particularly within the Ottoman world. Now, Nuria Hoja, can you kind of expand on that for us? Yes, well, you did a very nice introduction. I mean, well, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this to Anika and yourself and all the other uh, fellow calligraphers. It's very, very nice to be here. And regarding the history, yes, there, there were always women calligraphers, but I think like other fields, there were just not uh, 
recorded in the way that the male counterparts were recorded. But we do have sources. And I think it's a question of just the art historians need to do their work <laughs> and start you know, documenting more and, and making them uh, more widely available. But we do know that there were, for instance, one of the oldest examples which we saw in the slideshow was this beautiful Quran in a Kufic script, which was written already in the 10th century by a woman who was actually a freed slave. And in the Middle Ages in, in Muslim Spain, we know of hundreds of freed slaves or servants who, would, who were the scribes or the copyists for their masters. Um, later in Baghdad, actually, uh, remarkably, because nobody ever talks about this, but um, Anna Maria Schimmel does in her book, <laughs> but I mean, that's more or less it. Um, you know, uh, even um, the daughter of Ibn Mukla, Ibn Mukla, who was the great Baghdadi, uh, end of 10th century calligrapher responsible for creating the well-proportioned script and who is so well known. So it was his daughter who actually taught um, Ibn al-Bawab. And we also know that in the line of transmission between Ibn al-Bawab and Yakut al-Mustasimi, there's also a woman in the Silsila. And she was a great scholar, and her name was Zainab Shuhda Al Katiba, and she died in 1178. <laughs> so you see that there are actually remarkable women. There were also remarkable women who were jurists and poets, and you know, great scholars who were teaching hadith to men. Um, this was happening in many different parts of the Islamic world. And again, we need to remember the Islamic world. We're talking about 13th centuries of history. So for calligraphy also, 13 centuries of calligraphy history, many, many different regions. So obviously every region is going to be different. Um, but, you know, finally, it is true that in the later periods from the Middle Ages on for the classical scripts, the great calligraphers were usually either daughters of calligraphers, wives of calligraphers, <laughs> daughters of the Shah or the Sultans or, you know, from the sort of aristocratic um, um, upbringing. And then we also have many women from these backgrounds who were great patronesses of the arts and who would sponsor, um, you know, calligraphers, um, calligraphy on buildings and so on. So it, there's a very rich history and I, I don't think that now the situation is that different from what it was then. Um, but, you know, of course we live in the modern world and circumstances are different in the sense that we are working as, you know, it's, it's also a way to earn a living and so on. Mm. Um, but I mean, it's something that has been going on for, since the beginning, we can say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, and we were, we were talking just now about, um, the idea of a teacher-student relationship. And we were talking about, I think the term, if I'm not mistaken, is haki talib haki hoja, right? The rights of the student and the rights of the hoja. Mm. And so there, there's a structure to it, correct? Uh, Aisha Hoja, do you mind it telling us a bit about the, the structure of the hoja-student relationship? Well, no one ever told me specifically, you know, no one's ever written down the rules. I didn't read them in any book. But um, my direct experience with Zakaria Hoja is what I can tell. And I mean, it's something that arises naturally. It's not like you learn how to do this. It's when you find a teacher you want to study with, you ask permission to become their student. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was put off by Zach Koja several times. I called him up. I had been trying to study on my own and really I don't do well on my own. And so I was getting nowhere. I was sort of stuck and I heard about him. I called directory assistance here in the United <laughs> States and got his phone number, just called him, called him cold. And he said, no, he wouldn't take me as a student. But anyway, I, I convinced him. I, I said, I'll get in my car right now. I mean, he lives a five hour drive away, but he eventually relented. And I have seen him over the years. Sometimes he takes students, sometimes he doesn't. He says his intuition is always right. 
But mm. anyway, so there's a natural kind of respect for the teacher that arises, you know, right from the start. And, you know, basically you're following your teacher. I mean, that's, I, so, you know, you get permission to become a student, sort of like an intention. And then really you're copying your teacher. Um, the thing that I think is also important about, you know, it, as much as we respect our teachers, our teachers respect us as students. Mm -hmm. Like it's a mutual respect. Um, and over the years, I've just found that like, if I ask him a question, he's usually right in his answer. I mean, we've, you know, as you develop as a student, sometimes you develop your own opinions and your own tastes and they may differ with your teacher, but like 99.9% .9 of the time he is right. And it's always worth speaking to him. It's always worth speaking to him. Um, I mean, in, in our line, in my experience, you know, the, the teachers, the hojas, they earn their respect. And it's not just like on a technical and a calligraphic level, like there's a kind of integrity in the relationship that is just natural. And like I said, it's, it's a mutual respect. It's really, it's a wonderful relationship. I mean, you know, Zach Hoja is an American, I'm an American. There may be more, you know, codes of conduct that I'm just completely unaware of, but there's just an incredible amount of respect. I mean, I once, we did an event for him um, and my son-in-law who'd never met him, who doesn't know anything about Islamic calligraphy came to the event and later his comment was, there's so much respect. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's a very nice thing. It's a very mm -hmm. nice thing. Yeah, you, you do see that between between the student and the teacher and, and most I think in most fields, but, but I've seen it particularly within the calligraphic field. I think that I've noticed my fellow my uh the fellow students that are with me, um, there's a love and 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 honor of the knowledge that this person really holds. Right. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, I'm just, you know, we don't, another bit of code of conduct is that these hojas, when you're teaching one-on-one, -on -one, when you're teaching privately, or even if it's a group, but like in your home, there's no charge. Yeah. And, you know, the fact is, is that it's in respect to this knowledge that has been passed down over all these centuries. Like, if we were to pay for that, how much is that worth? That's worth mm -hmm. so much more than any dollar, any number of dollars mm -hmm. could be. And, you know, it's, um, it's invaluable. It's a treasure. Absolutely. And and so you mentioned that you uh, started working with Hojum uh, uh, a while ago. Was Probably before you were born. <laughs> was was I there was the slowest student in all of calligraphic history? <laughs> well, it's it's about persistence, right? That's what it's really about. That's that's the uh, that's the idea. Because even after the ijaz is completed, if I'm not mistaken. It really, that is the jumping off point of really understanding what calligraphy is. And now you can start truly absorbing on a different level. Is, is that correct? Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But you were, you were mentioning that um, you, you noticed some things. Was there a particular piece of calligraphy that you saw where once you saw it, you said, I'm no longer going to be a spectator? This is this is my calling. This is what I have to do. This is what I must at least try. Are you asking all of us, or? I, well, I was asking you, Aisha Hoja. Okay. Yeah. No, there was not one piece of calligraphy. I happened to be a teenager, and I was in Istanbul, and 
just, I kept seeing calligraphy everywhere and I just instantly wanted to do it. And I mean, it took another 10 years before I even found a teacher, so. Yeah. And and what about you, Gomer Koja? You was there something in particular that you saw that that really spoke to you? It, it wasn't a particular piece. It was more the the form of the letters and the rhythm. So for me, when I saw um, Tholuk, for example, there there was a flow, a, a rhythm in that that I, I felt. So. And I think that that um, that captured me. So I always had a love for it. And I think that um, Georgia O'Keeffe, your American artist, this, as a child, I read um, a quote that she wrote, wrote, and she was saying that if you take a flower for a moment and really look at it, it's your world for that moment. And I think that kind of transfers a feeling of what I felt about calligraphy and the letters that, you know, even now when I'm sitting alone and I'm just doing the Karalama practice and I'm looking at uh, Shoki Effendi, I, I'm in awe still, you know, and, and it's, it's just his basic alphabet, just the, the, the flow of the letters, everything about it, it just moves you uh, a little and I don't know if I can explain it it's, it's a physical kind of thing you you feel like you're going in a rhythm with this calligraphy and so when you study it so you see all the nuances of why that is created and why you're feeling that because there are these subtle curves and turns and twists and you're like wow <laughs> it, yeah. it's amazing you know how mm -hmm. how uh, you know, at a first glance, you can't see those, and it's only by the guidance of your teacher mm -hmm. and the physical instruction that they give that you start seeing it. And the and the more you go into it, the more um, detail is coming out of that. But I did want to comment on on the relationship <laughs> with your master, yes. and I think one of the the important thing for me was that this bond is created. It's based on the fact, for me, for my personal, was that our Hoja is teaching us how to write the Quran. So in essence, your, your, your first uh, connection is through uh, the Quran. And that's why we're, we're writing. Um, so the, the respect that uh, increases is that it's also, there's also a love that increases as your uh, bond develops with you, your, your letters and your master. So it's, it's you know, we're, we're looking at the letters of the Quran and, you know, just looking at the letters can have a beautiful manifestation on you. So, and that, that is taken to another level when you're working with a master who has become what he is writing and you see it in their presence and you see it in their, um, almost an aura around them that they have, whether they believe that or not, you're attracted to the beauty that has reflected from their years of practice. And I think that uh, certainly for me with Hassan Hoja, uh, in, uh, when I first met him, I instantly knew that this was my teacher. Um, this is who I wanted to study with because I, um, that there was something very special about him. Yeah, it's lovely. It's beautiful, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to go back to one thing that you said earlier, you were quoting Georgia O'Keeffe, and um, I mean, I know that a lot of times people begin to see calligraphers within this this vortex of calligraphy, you know, and and this is their entire identity. But there are so many other art forms that we're inspired by, so many things outside of the calligraphic world that touch us and that we draw upon. Some people draw upon music, some people draw upon sculpture. Um, Gulnara Koja, is there something else that, that informs your work when you, when do you draw to it? So it's a little bit difficult for me to answer that because my entry to calligraphy wasn't art related. So where it was more of a spiritual journey or, or in search of something. Mm. So I, um, I didn't come into it because of the art. I wanted to connect with the letters, which was a way for me to connect with um, the divine, so, so to speak. 
So I was working as a, a consultant. It was very cutthroat, you know, and it, it was very much like a sieve mo mo um, moment where they really took away some things from uh, from the self, basically. Mm -hmm. So now I, I don't regret that experience because that there was a lot of learning there. But I think it also put me out of sync. That there was something that was um, not balanced internally. So I was very mind orientated so so i wanted to uh, to reconnect with uh, creativity through um, um, a connection with god basically so for me it was very much um, not i didn't even know uh, what calligraphy was in in terms of istanbul and, and the magnificence of it i had no idea of the level of hassan hoja so I had a, a basically a very clean palette. So my search was more for um, a regaining a balance within myself. And then that, um, out of that situation, I think it's really for me, um, a certain prayer arose that I was in need of something, but I don't know what. So I was calling on for help to show me what that was. And so that's how my journey started. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't know about the Ijaz system. I didn't know that Istanbul was the center of learning. I just went on this journey and I ended up in Malaysia. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was just um, a, a time out from work, for example. And I thought I'd explore um, Malaysia. Or I took a, a break from, um, from, from work. And see, this is what, what was so interesting. And the first day I landed in Kuala Lumpur, I ran into a student of Muhammad Zakaria. And he, in our conversation, he said, well, no, 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 this is not the right place. You need to be in Istanbul. So whilst I was waiting for my course in, in uh, Shah Alam to start, I started looking up who Muhammad Zakaria was and I had not heard of Muhammad Zakaria. And so, there was a article he wrote about his experience of going uh, invited, being invited to Istanbul. And then uh, he was sat with all these greats, we know who they are now in, at Ersika, and he was told to retrain in the Ottoman uh, style. So you, you're all familiar with his journey and his story. So I think the penny dropped then that if somebody like Zach Hodja is being told to retrain, in the Ottoman uh, style, and I thought that I'm definitely in the wrong uh, place. So I thought, so then it rerouted me back to Istanbul and then uh, to Hassan Hoca. So, yeah. so for me, and um, maybe I'm repeating myself, so it's, it's a very much a personal journey. And I didn't, uh, I had no expectations of where it would go or, or where I would end up or whether I'd be teaching. So it's all part of the process that followed on from one step to the next. And then when you meet somebody like Hassan Hoja and all the great masters, and I have to really pay homage to them because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be really here. And all of them are men who dedicated their time to, to us with lots of compassion and, and mercy and were very generous with the knowledge you know, that I received from Hassan Hoja and his time. So, so um, yeah, so when you study with somebody like that, it, it kind of, you, you get hooked because you see the beauty and he made it look so easy and the flow of the ink, the, the way the color moves and you just, you know, you're, you're just mesmerized by it. And, you know, they're all, all so great in Istanbul and, and you know, we can't um, begin to explain how great that experience was for us in Istanbul. Yeah. That's, that's quite beautiful. And um, Nuria Hoja, did you also have that same experience that, that I mean, it's, nobody has the same journey, but how did you find yourself coming into this world? Um, all right, well, it's a bit of also like Gulnas, kind of like a, you know, long-winded way, but um, I, I did have an attraction for Islamic art and I, I did want to 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 find um, a path in Islamic art because um, Dr. Nasser Said Hussein Nasser had told me that this was possible and so the the way for me at that time is was going to Morocco and that's where I spent uh, a year exploring different arts and crafts and and I met a self-taught calligrapher 
who who was extremely generous and 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 a wonderful man but he had no method he was self-taught and so on and so however that first contact i i'm i will always be grateful to him because he opened my first column and ink photocopy paper i mean everything was very basic you know ink on a plate without liquor or anything but it did give me a feel for how simple this art was simple in the in the sense of materials you know just calum ink paper and solitude and that really drew me because the other crafts i was doing at the time we you know you you needed like a whole group of people you know for the tiles to you know the oven the this the that it was very complex and this appeared so simple even though the art was i had no idea at the time how difficult it really was and then that's when I started looking for a real teacher who had an ijaza. And I knew of Muhammad Zakaria, and that's how it all started. I, I wrote a letter and I asked him if he would accept me as his student. And I sent him my CV, <laughs> 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 which now when I think about it, it's like the worst possible <laughs> introduction. <laughs> but just to show him I was serious. And, and so I moved back to DC and he also made me he said he was very busy. He made me go to the Library of Congress for three months before he would even greet me. And, and that's what I did. I just did everything he told me to. And, um, and, and I'm always so, so grateful that he was my first teacher because thanks to him, um, he, he gave me that, that deep love and respect. And as Aisha was saying, you know, that, that profound respect that he shows his students. And, and you naturally, you show him the same respect. And it's a very, very beautiful and profound relationship. And yes, that's, that's how all, we'll, and of course then the journey continued in Istanbul. But I mean that for me, I, I always think um, and say that if it hadn't been for Hassan Hoja, I mean for Sekiria Hoja, sorry, um, maybe I, I wouldn't have continued in the path of calligraphy. I had, if I had started, in another country, I don't know, in the Arab world, or, you know, really, he was really the door, and, um, yeah. Oh, that's, that's really quite beautiful, and, and so when you, I think I know that um, you all have taken students on, is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. and for some of you, um, you know, this is, this is really a, a new world that we live in, uh, but the mesh process, the corrected lesson, it's quite an active process. It's not something that can be, you know, um, digitally scanned and, you know, you have to see the, the posture of the teacher as he writes. You have to see what the consistency of the ink is. You have to see how he cuts the, the pen, you know, how he puts the pen to paper and moves it in the most nuanced ways to create this beautiful flow. But now we live in a digital world. We have conferences over Zoom. There are benefits to it. I don't think we could have done something like this or would have even thought to do something like this before. But there are lots of things that we've had to readjust as, as students. And how have you as teachers, um, yeah, Aisha Hoji, maybe you can uh, take this on and let us know, how has this transition been for you into a more digital teaching age? Well, it's kind of necessity. I mean, I really only have a few private students and one of them is Anika, who's an excellent student and who started Scripps and Scribes. So we owe it all to her. But um, I would say that, you know, Actually, another part of the code is you have to have direct contact with your teacher. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, I live mm -hmm. in New York State. Mohammed Zakaria lives in Northern Virginia, but I went and I met him first and then we continued through the mail and I would go see him as often as I could. Mm -hmm. um, so I have always resisted, people have said, make videos, teach online. I mean, first of all, I am a Luddite and I am lazy and I'm old. So um, combination is that, you know, I, I managed to find a space in New York and I actually get some paying students. But um, 
when the pandemic hit, and I mean, this is New York, we were shut down really fast, really, mm -hmm. I mean, should have been faster, but uh, so, you know, after about a month of shock, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think we're all, I am still a little bit in shock. Mm -hmm. um, I realized, you know, first of all, people need something to do. I mean, I had family members who usually aren't really all that interested in what I do, but they're like, you know, people are home. People want to do classes. People need to do classes. And of course, Anika convinced me. But I mean, I also teach Latin script for the New York Public Library. Like now they want videos. So I've actually made a couple videos, which are not very easy to make. I say that. And I'm doing Zoom classes and it's just because people need connection. This is a safe and healthy connection. It is far from ideal, far, far from ideal. But I'll tell you, like, I have a student who's kind of on again, off again, who I met when I went to Dallas to give a thing at the Dallas Museum. And, you know, he's, he's coming now on Sundays. I can see him every Sunday but it's never going to be the same as human contact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is how things are. <laughs> Everybody mm -hmm. is trying to do their best. Mm -hmm. um, these are extreme and weird times. And I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. I think people need contact and, most of us are experiencing some kind of shock and trauma, even if we're not admitting it. Mm -hmm. Sorry to, you know, sound so grave and melodramatic, but, um, you know. Oh, but what, is, what is art but uh, a way to pull ourselves, you're right, out of, you know, the things that cause us sadness, you know, we turn towards one art form or another, one medium or another to kind of uplift our spirits and what better than a sacred art, you know? So it's, it's quite beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that one of the things and uh, we've been getting a few questions that kind of tie in with what we're talking about. So I, I wanted to, to actually look at a few of these. Um, one is is the basic idea of a hoja. What what does that term mean? When does one receive that term? And how uh, are women identified as hoja? Is it is it another term or is it the same term? Uh, Gomel Hoja, can you please uh, take that one? It, so they so in 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 the calligraphy sense, once you have got your ijazah that's after many years of hard work. Naturally, people after that, uh, that's the first step of, of stepping into the real life of calligraphy. Before that, um, it's very much a process of unfolding. So what the jazz tends to do, it, it allows you to sign your work and it gives you authorization to teach and also issue the jazz. And in the Turkish sense, the, the word hoja, though sometimes it's used on the streets as well, um, but it, it's someone of religious knowledge. So Hassan Hoja is definitely somebody of that status. He is uh, an imam. He was a hafiz of the Quran, so he's memorized the Quran. You know, he was an imam. So he qualifies somebody of that status. Um, for me, uh, I still feel a bit shy being called by Hoja by some students because I just see myself um, as somebody who really loves and is passionate about my art and, and wanting to share the beauty of it. So we can't teach it in the same way as we were taught because the expectations here in the UK are slightly different, the, 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 the way we direct the students. And so it's more of an introductory uh courses that we're giving so we're, we're giving them a taste of what's what calligraphy is and what could be if you were to follow this path so so that that there changes the way that we're teaching anyway so so if you get a few very serious students and you work in the traditional sense which is that they come for 10 15 minutes 
like we did, and you have your mesh checked, you can be in a group, stay or leave whenever you want. It's a very informal, organic, natural process. But when you transfer that to the UK, for example, it's more, students have a lot more questions. They want to see a lot more demonstrations. They want to push their, push as much as they can to get more of what's um, sometimes trying to get out more, more what is needed. So, it, so I just feel I'm a teacher rather than a hoja. I'm a teacher who is um, demonstrating what the impact of calligraphy can be. And also, I also go down the route of trying to unfold things for my students. And a lot of the work is, is really down to the students, but you're really making connections and helping them with the angles and the inks and trying to make their life a little bit easier and giving them lots of shortcuts in that in that short space of time. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's very much um, uh, a, a more like a teacher relationship here that I, I feel I have with my students. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And and now that we are in, in these pandemic times, you know, lots of, uh, again, uh, Aisha Hoja was mentioning that it's it's really we we have to kind of push forward with new methods of teaching, but um, yeah, what at what point is it no longer possible? You know, when when we what is then lost, right, with the teacher student relationship? Because you're saying that it comes from more than just the actual training right more than just the actual sitting down and and writing there is that respect there is that connection and those connections then become lost um, over for example zoom uh, what if a student is unable should they become a, a, a person who starts with these workshops and then hopefully then they can move forward um, or is it just not something that's then possible no, I, I think that you should explore every means, but be aware that the real to do, because we've had that experience, we know what the benefits are of being with your teacher and seeing them. So it's a necessity that's uh, come out of a situation here uh, because of the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, my, the, the institutes that I work for are asking me to do online courses, but with two children, it's, it's been almost very difficult to, to structure that and to do that. So even though it's become a necessity, sometimes there's limitations on what you can and cannot do. So as far as students, I think, I think as an intro or access to this knowledge, because you should... Um, but not to rely on it totally with the view of trying to get to a teacher and I, I guess maybe one of the ways is to find a teacher who is local to you so you're lucky you have Aisha close by that mm -hmm. you're able to visit and then the the other thing is that I think you work a lot in seclusion when you're doing calligraphy and the practice so it's very it's a necessity also for your internal self to have that release with other individuals and students to, to have that contact with your teacher. So it's, it's also very important because if you isolate yourself too much, you know, that is also not good for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and many, many people are asking from the audience now, what, what is the step to finding a hoja? How, how does one really begin that process if it's something that they are interested in? May, may I say something? Yes, um, before I quite get to that point, I mean, we, the three of us, have been extremely lucky to have, like, stumbled upon yeah. this, this yes. you know, Ottoman school with mm -hmm. the Jaza, with the Silsila, the chain of transmission. And, you know, we've shared teachers, you know, like, but, um, you know, there are people, there have been historical figures who've actually studied on their own. And in mm -hmm. fact, Dode Hoja, Nuria's main teacher, um, said to me, you know, becoming a master is something that just people recognize over time. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
it's we are we have benefited we have this beautiful relationship but that's not the only way yeah i would say like find whoever you can find but in addition if they don't i mean and this is just i think we would all agree on this because this is how we were trained if your teacher doesn't have an ijaza keep an open mind Mm. because there are people who are teaching who, who are not part of this classical um, school you know, that's gone over generations. And you know, that may not be, they may not be the finest teachers or they're exemplars, they're examples of letter forms may not be you know, as fine as ours are. But still, I would say anything you can do. And in fact, for me personally, when I wanted to do Arabic letters and I couldn't find a teacher, I started doing Latin script calligraphy. I mean, that's, that's how I got there because I wanted to use a pen and I loved that black on white and that, mm. you know, what I would say it's between dance and music. Mm. That's what, what yeah. calligraphy is. And um, I would say do whatever you can, but also Scripps and Scribes is offering courses online. <laughs> they are i'm teaching them some of them i mean oh, that's wonderful. yes no that's that's great i mean i think that a lot of people you know if they they want to continue after this conversation if they show some sort of interest i mean it's one of those forms of art that again i think all of you have mentioned it looks so simple and it looks so easy and yet once you delve into the world the complexities of it reveal themselves instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And you become so overwhelmed with awe at what's been, what's been done before, what's been produced before. And the idea of studying these older pieces really just I think, fall into that world, right? To, to be surrounded by that world in solitude, right? By yourself is also a wonderful way to go. Yeah. And inshallah, this era will end. I mean, I feel like we've all we've all been put into this. Like humanity is going through something. There's obviously a reason for it. And, you know, God willing, it'll come to an end and we'll all be able to travel again. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I know that the, the ijaza is something that a lot of people focus on. Um, they want to get through their lessons. They want to receive the ijaza and then, uh, for, and it's not a small accomplishment by any means, but that is not the end point. And we see that many people ask, um, how long will it take realistically? for me to get my ijaza. It changes the experience, obviously, for different people with families, people who also have another job, people mm -hmm. who are single and have family obligations. What is your answer, Nuria Hoja, to that very loaded question? How long does it take <laughs> to get your ijaza? Yes, well, as, as Aisha was explaining and Gulnas, you know, we, we follow this very precise curriculum in the Ottoman school, the way we teach. So the, the way it works is that every student passes the lesson when they're ready, when they've understood a lesson and they pass to the next one. So there's not a standard amount of time saying you need to spend, I don't know, a month on each lesson. No, some students may spend two weeks, some students may spend eight months, you know? So it, it changes completely. Yes, Aisha. No, I mean, I've, I've spent a year on a, on a lesson. Yeah, yeah, I also, I spent a year on my first Rabbi Yesed and with Zekeri Hoja. <laughs> so, so, and then we see people who receive their ijazah. I would say maybe record timing would be four years. I've, I've seen um, students in Turkey, but that's really like remarkable. I got it after seven years. And then there's students who get it after. I, I saw a man getting his ijazah when he was 80. And I think he had been studying with Hassan Hoja for I don't know how many years, you know? And that's actually the beauty of it, that it's um, every person is different and every person's, you know, they, they advance at their own rhythm. 
And so it's a completely uh, individualized method, we can, we can say. And um, that's why I always say to my students, to be honest, forget about the jazz, that really the most important thing, and actually Zakiria who just said this to me, he said, enjoy these moments of being a student. Yes. And I didn't realize what he yeah. meant. I was like, what does he <laughs> yeah. mean? This is terrible, struggling with a mesh, repeating the same thing a thousand times, getting all this ready. What is he, you know, I didn't, it didn't. And then I was like, he's so right. Because those moments that you, the only thing you have to do is focus on analyzing the work and practicing and having those very nice moments of solitude, as Kulnas was saying. Um, that is, you, you, that's what you have, that's what makes you fall in love with calligraphy. And then if you, if you fall in love and you have that love, everything else will come after that. But it's, um, if you get fixated on, I want to get my jazz, I want to get my jazz, then the love will just, you know, disappear. You'll be frustrated. You'll be focusing on, on other things. So I, I, and finally, the jazz is really not that important because um, finally what prevents you from, from advancing is yourself. So I think uh, the jazz, especially today, we, I, I do want to say this, um, there is a tendency um, by certain teachers to give the jazzes very quickly out of a very good intention to spread calligraphy all over the world. So, the, so we, we see certain, I'm just saying this because sometimes um, people have the jazz a little bit too idealized. The jazz just means you've done the curriculum, you've studied, you've gotten to a certain point, and then it really depends on who your teacher was. Because some teachers, like Mehmed Ozje, I think he's only given, I don't know, four jaza in his life. <laughs> Meaning, because he has extremely high standards. And then there are other teachers who give many more. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. Both are completely um, legitimate, of course. But it just, um, it, it's just to emphasize this aspect of the jaza as the beginning. Just means you've gotten to a certain point and now you begin your life as a calligrapher. So when you have the jaza, really, it's, it's like step A in being a calligrapher. And you have to continue the relationship with your teacher. You have to continue visiting them, showing them your work. And we are lifelong students always and, until we die. So, so yes, so the, the question of how long does it take to, to get the jaza really has no answer, <laughs> finally. <laughs> no, no, that's the, and that's the perfect answer, isn't it? Though, because uh, <laughs> we are consistently students in every other manner of life as well. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. No, this is this is wonderful. Um, I'm going to go through a few more of uh of the questions here. Um, so one person is saying that they live in Italy and the culture of Arabic calligraphy isn't known. Oh, um, shall we say calligraphy in the Arabic script, right? Because Islamic yeah. calligraphy, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, it holds one subset and then Arabic calligraphy falls under another subset. But as uh, Muhammad Tadriya Hojan, he says, and as Aisha Hoja said the other day, you know, we want to be aware of how we define these things. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we spread this beautiful art and encourage people to learn it correctly. Because as we've mentioned, maybe there are teachers without Ijazma, but you know, we want to make sure that people see the purest, I, I don't want to say the purest, but the 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 form that runs true to the standards that are set, right? Um, and the beauty then evolves from there. So how do we help others see uh, this type of calligraphy? How do we spread this message of calligraphy? Um, I'm sorry, Gulnaz Hoja. Sorry, I did not direct that to a single person. Gulnaz, <laughs> can you answer that? Um, I'm not sure I, I think like Nuria, Aisha, we're all working really hard outside uh, because we have this sense of responsibility because it's a transmission of knowledge and that we, we want to relay that in the most accurate way as we can within our capabilities. So we're doing that through workshops or talks or 
just exposing ourselves. And I think that firstly, the term calligraphy is problematic when it comes to using it in terms of um, Arabic or Islamic calligraphy, because we have a whole science behind it. And so generally what we're having, we're having uh, everything that's uh, beautiful handwriting is lumped under the word calligraphy. So everyone is, uh, even if they use the Arabic letters, they're calligraphers. And so I would, I would really suggest that, you know, uh, um, look, everyone really needs to do their research and look at what uh, the science behind Islamic or Arabic calligraphy is, and then really find out the value of what, what, what it is that you're studying, because this is a tradition which is like, uh, like developed over 900 years, and then it was taken over by the Ottomans, which is another 500 years. So it's not a, a quick process, it's a slow process so and the the so once you you've done your own research i think people them themselves realize even from the classes that i give uh, the understanding isn't there mainly because you have to really do it correctly to really understand the depths of it and so over the eight weeks when students come to the classes that the, their perception of it has changed and i think that's best we can do at the moment is to do the best we can with the teachings that we're doing and try to spread it. Um, you know, I do get asked this question, what do you think of so and so and so and so? Um, you know, it's, it's somebody else's style, it's their method. But for us as classically trained, we've been exposed to the details of it and the beauty of it. So we, we can see that sometimes the letters are broken or that they've totally um, distorted some letters and it, it just throws off the beauty and the balance and the harmony that's contained within a single letter. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if Nuri and Aisha want to add to it, but I think for me, it's mainly trying to uh, focus on the teaching and, and to just take as many opportunities as we can to spread the beauty of uh, calligraphy and there's so much out there now so when I started there was nobody really in England mm. so that's why we went to Istanbul yeah. but you we have students all over the world now in hosting calligraphy in their home countries so it's not as difficult as it was before mm. and I think people are also becoming more aware of the Ottoman school and all the calligraphers and mm. everybody knows Noria <laughs> <laughs> So everyone knows, Gloria. So, you know, this is your, things like this are the, are the uh, starting point of spreading it. Mashallah. So, so that point, Aisha, I mean, are there any, do you know of any books, this is another question, that are in English, any resources for English speaking students to help understand the characteristics of different strokes of the different, uh, the different scripts? Um, things besides the the, the Shevsky book, uh, the uh, that the Shevsky of... book is like yeah. our Bible. I mean, <laughs> you know, the Shevsky book. I only have one copy of that left, and it's water damaged, and it's on my desk, and I look at it almost every day. Um, yeah. I. Yeah. The best source I have had for books has always been in Istanbul. Sometimes they're mm -hmm. translated into English. What I want to say is sometimes we lose the forest for the trees. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you find yourself backed into a corner struggling with, you know, the, the little bit, the two millimeters of the final curve of the noon. And, you know, like, you need to take a step back and you need to realize that the point of calligraphy is to make people read the message and for it to be beautiful. And sometimes as calligraphers, we're so finely trained that, you know, we look at something and if we don't like the style, um, you know, we just, like, I don't think, I mean, there's, I would definitely encourage everybody, yes, find a teacher within Jaza, yes. Most of the stuff that's in and around and emanating from Istanbul is going to be good. But just in general, this is a communication art. 
Mm. And actually the message is really important. I mean, that's mm. the ultimate thing is that we're, we're trying to be vessels yeah. uh, for this message. And, you know, we want to make things beautiful, but I think many of us calligraphers have obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> You're so nitpicking. And, and the other thing is that in the beginning, when you come to this art, you know, one of the, one of the training, an area where you're trained, you're training your hand, you're, tr you're learning technique, you're learning how to dip your pen into ink, you're learning how to push that ink across the paper. You know, you, there's so many technical things we're learning, the letter forms, you know, um, the strokes, but um, I just lost my train of thought. But the fact is, is that there's a bigger picture here. And, oh, I know what I was gonna say. It's the letter forms. I mean, so we're learning the technique with our hand, but we're also learning the forms and we need to internalize those forms, those shapes. And it can take a while. I mean, it can take seven years. It can take more than 20 years. It can take a lifetime to really get them as good as we want them. But when you're a beginner, you don't see that much. I mean, mm -hmm. part of the training is learning to see those little details. So, you know, for somebody in a country where there's not a lot of samples of Islamic calligraphy, just expose yourself as much as possible. You know, there's books. I mean, every museum now has an online collection, right? Mm -hmm. um, expose yourself to it. And then over time, you'll get into details to the point that sometimes is actually ridiculous, but, <laughs> but it does it like beautiful forms. I mean, it does. I, 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 ju I just want to, to add something, if I may, that, that um, I, I see my students now, they've become extremely spoiled. Um, because when we were studying, we did not have all these online resources. And even there weren't as many books. I remember when I had to go to the Library of Congress because Muhammad Zakaria said, read everything you can find about calligraphy. I didn't read Arabic fluently. So I was looking at all the books in French and Spanish and English, and there wasn't that much. There were maybe, I don't know, three or four good books. And that was, you know, Anna Maria Schimmel, who's like my Bible. And I mean, I mean, books written about calligraphy, you know, and then books that contained good examples. We had Letters in Gold by Ur Derman from the Sakib mm -hmm. Savanji, remember? Yes. And so it's actually in the recent years that they have so much more. And now there's Instagram where you have this crazy amount of images. Like I just now with my students, I just give them the, the, the Instagram account. I just say, follow this, 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 this. And they're getting this like every day, this incredible examples. I mean, everybody's on their phone anyway. So they're like being fed <laughs> beautiful yeah. calligraphy. We didn't have that. Daud Hoja, uh, he always uh, tells us how he would go to the mosque and just lay on his back and look at the inscriptions because they didn't even have the books at that time, you know, and they, they didn't even have the photocopies. So they actually had to go to the mosque and look and observe. And that's how they found inspiration. Sometimes I give, you know, like huge files to my students with examples and high resolution. And then I realize they're not even looking at it, <laughs> you know? And they're like, how do you do this connection? And I'm saying, you know, look it up. And they're like, oh, no, no, it's easier if you just tell me, you know? So I do think there is a, it's happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere, but there is a, a, a bit of a, I don't know, like with so much information, people become more lazy. Whereas when you have less, then you're like really active because whatever little source you find, you know, you, and that's, I mean, if you see Mohammed Sekiria the way he is, you know, he's always, always, always studying and reading. And you know, he's a completely an active learner. And I think that's actually one of the things that it's really important in calligraphy that it all, everything actually has to come from the student. Uh, yeah. Well, um, Hojas, uh, thank you so much for being with us. I could talk to you for another three hours at least, but our time is up. Um, so I, I give the floor to Anika. Well, thank, thank you, Anika. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much uh, for such an inspiring talk.
and Mariam for moderating the event. Uh, I know we can, we can continue this. I would love to continue this. Um, and uh, please visit our website, scriptsandscribes.com. We have a few work workshops coming up in July. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.